You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, once again, we're gonna, we're probably going to end up being all over the map here. Um, again, I don't want every day to turn into just a drama fest, but as things occur, we'll talk about it. Um, and whether or not it's just a real quick drive by, hey, here's my thoughts and uh, moving on to the news and notes, or a full blown one hour scream fest, I never know going into it, but. Um, I do have a couple things I wanted to discuss. However, just on the off chance that things do get a little carried away, um, I don't think they will, but that means nothing. What I think is about to happen has no bearing on what's actually going to happen. I do want to start with just some of the more general news and notes. I completely forgot to mention yesterday, although it's not, I don't know, maybe all that interesting because I don't have too much to comment on. The, uh, not the 49ers, the Bears and the Minnesota Vikings have hired um, new GMs. The Minnesota Vikings have decided to go with Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, relatively young man at the age of 40 years old. He was uh, starting off as an executive manager of football research and development for the San Francisco 49ers in 2013 through 2016. He was then promoted to director of football research and development from 2017 to 2019. The Cleveland Browns hired him for vice president of football operations 2020 to 2021 and then GM, I tell you what, man, um, that's a pretty rapid ascent. It really is. To start in 2013 as a you know, R&D guy, to um, you know, then be promoted from within after three years, which you know, I, maybe that's a normal period of time. doesn't sound like it's a, a major jump up to director of football research and development, but um, to then become a vice president over for the Cleveland Browns, and then after just basically a well two years 2020 and 2021 the Vikings hire you as the GM I mean that's it doesn't tell us anything and that's that's the main theme that I'm going to be going with as far as Vikings and uh, Bears GM and all that stuff we won't know anything very similar to um, head coach also in terms of you know you can be the best offensive or defensive coordinator in the world it really doesn't tell me much about your ability to be a head coach we've learned that many many times um, it's a different job, and so we'll have to see. But I, I can tell you that uh, Kwesi Adolfo Mensa has l- rocketed to the top. Um, again, just, just that last couple years. In 2019, he's director of football research for the 49ers. In 2020, he's made vice president of football operations for Cleveland. Two years later, he's the general manager of the Vikings. That's crazy. I mean, if you look at... Um, Brian Gutekunst, he, he started as a scout in 1998. He was then a scout for the Packers from 1998 to 2011. That's like 13 years of being a scout just in Green Bay on top of being a scout for the Kansas City Chiefs. Then after all that time, he gets to be director of college scouting. That was 12, 13, 14, 15. That's four years. Then he's 2016 and 17 as director of player personnel before 2018 becoming the general manager. So it, it did kind of compress at the end there. But it was still many more years, and it was an internal hire. Um, the other interesting thing with Kwesi is that his reputation went so far outside the building that the Cleveland Browns felt good after just a couple years of hiring him as VP and then Minnesota after just two years as a GM. Um, if you look at uh, Ted Thompson, he was um, starting off as far as his exec- executive career, assistant director of pro personnel in 1992. 93, 4, 5, 6, 7, director of pro personnel. So it went from assistant to director. Then 97, 98, and 99, he was uh, director of player personnel. So he was on the pro and player side. Then he went to the Seattle Seahawks to become the vice president of football operations, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. Then he comes back to be the general manager of the Green Bay Packers in 2005. So he started in 1992, and in 2005, he's the GM. So again, Pretty rapid ascent. I mean, the guy's reputation is clearly pretty impressive. Now, I can't speak to much. My only instinct would be, well, let's take a look at what um, the Cleveland Browns were able to do the last couple of years um, and use that as a metric. 
The problem is that doesn't necessarily tell me very much. I mean, it can. He's obviously um, partially responsible, and if he ends up getting the job, then you would assume that he's largely responsible. Um, but the problem with that is, can you judge Brian Gutekunst based on Ted Thompson's last couple of years of drafting? No. I've already told you when we go over to the, the Chicago Bears, um, the Bears are hiring Chiefs Assistant Director of Player Personnel Ryan Poles as their next general manager. I've already told you I haven't been impressed with the Chiefs drafts the last couple of years, right? They had unbelievable, basically from, geez, I don't know, 2009 all the way through, and, and Ryan Poles was there during that time, um, starting in 2009, basically all through that period. At the very least, their first and or second round picks have been very impressive. But the last three or four years, not so much. It's when it's the first time you look at it and go, eh, not not great. Not all bad, but not there seems to be a bit of a drop off. But I can't put that all on um, polls, just like I can't put the last couple of years of Ted Thompson's drafts on Brian Gutekunst. Their their records kind of stand alone. Um, their philosophies and and how that pairs with the teams, whether it be Ryan Poles with the Chicago Bears or Quessy with the Minnesota Vikings, there is a certain vision. And then that there's how that vision correlates to what the Vikings want to do. You know, I mean, it's you know, when Quessy comes into Minnesota, it's not just a matter of how good of a drafter are you, although that's maybe the biggest factor. And I don't know how they even assess that necessarily. But it's also what is what, it, you know, OK, so I, I give you this job. What is your plan? What do you see for us? So he had to have come up with a vision prior to going there. Tell me about my team. What's what's what are we doing wrong over here? What are we doing right? What 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 would you do here? And after giving that plan, the you know the Wilfs heard it and said that's that's pretty much exactly correct. That's that's brilliant. That's what I would do. That's yes, let's do that, please. And then you know the secondary piece is I think this is the person that can execute it. So it's the right plan and the right guy to execute that plan. But again, I can't really give any insights, and I'm not even going to bother going through the draft histories of the Browns and the Chiefs because that's a completely different issue. It really doesn't mean anything. It's very similar to coaching hires when you start looking at wins and losses of their teams or even the the quality of their offenses and defenses as offensive and defensive coordinators. It's just a waste of time. I did that song and dance with Matt LaFleur, and I said, I don't know, Titans got worse. I'm kind of scared about this guy, and he came in, and he was great. Same with our defensive coordinator. Remember, everybody freaked out because his record was so bad everywhere he went, and then he came over here, and suddenly our defense got real good. Remember that? That was weird, right? Suddenly, Preston just exploded. Suddenly, we had an inside linebacker that can play. Suddenly, our corners look really good, including Razul Douglas, who's never really looked good at stuff. Remember how Kenny Clark had his best year basically since, um, you know, Dom Capers was here? A lot of people had their best years. The safeties, maybe not as much, but as, you know, again, I don't know this to be the case. I'm hoping to talk to uh, Coach Hahn in the next couple of days here, but I do remember them saying that's a critical part of the defense, and it really kind of hangs on their shoulders a lot in terms of them being able to grasp it. So maybe it's one of those things that's going to take a little extra time for the safeties. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just saying. I'm just spitballing here, all right? But um, as much as I would love to do some kind of a deep dive on this, I got nothing. Um, the, uh, the word on the street is that these guys have great reputations, but that's, that's duh, right? <laughs> Why else are they getting hired if they had bad rep? I mean, everybody's got some kind of a reputation and if these guys are getting snapped up real fast, then you got to assume that it's a pretty good reputation. By the way, Ryan Poles, um, he got, he kind of started off. He's been a, uh, chiefs guy. I said since 2009, and that was pretty good, not guess, but I remembered properly. But um, it's also worth noting that he also played for the Chicago Bears. It was uh, really not very extensive. He was a uh, practice squad member in 2008, and that was basically the extent of his NFL playing career. But he does have a little bit of history in Chicago. Um, Basically spent a year as a graduate assistant in Boston College and then goes to the Kansas City Chiefs as a scouting assistant. So it's one of those things where his playing career didn't really take off, but he still loved football. He wanted to get involved. He Worked as hard as he could to to figure out how to get back into the NFL in some capacity. The Kansas City Chiefs gave him a shot as a scouting assistant. And then uh, in 2010, he was promoted to college scouting coordinator. So obviously, he must have done a pretty good job. They gave him a boost immediately. Did that from 2010 to 2015. Then he was director of college scouting, 2016 to 2018. Then he was assistant director of player personnel, 2019-2020, executive director of player personnel, 2021, and then the Bears brought him in as a, as a general manager. I think that was also a pretty rapid ascent. He just wasn't skipping steps. You know, I mean, he, he, he you know how some people, when they go up the steps, they kind of go tick, 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 all the way up. And then some people, it's more like they launch themselves up three steps at a time. 
they're both going up pretty fast. The Chiefs just decided to give him small chunks at a time, but he, he every single time, whatever job they gave him, he knocked it out of the park. They're like, all right, let's go one more step further, knocked it out of the park one more step further. And with Questy, they're like, I don't know, dude, just make him a VP. This is stupid. And it was the Browns that did. It wasn't even the, the, his home team. The Browns are like, right, this guy sounds great, let's hire him. And, and again, he must have done a good job with the Browns because the Vikings heard about the job he was doing as VP after skipping several steps. They're like, I want that guy as my GM. So, I, again, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not declaring this guy's going to be a great GM. I'm just saying... Clearly, they're they're ascending pretty rapidly, and everything kind of makes sense. But we'll see. One thing that I would say is we probably should give them a a one year grace period. Um, I've mentioned how Brian Gutekunst's worst year of drafting was probably his first year, although twenty twenty threw some cast some doubt on that theory. But the point is when when you're hired in January and you have to assemble a whole new team. And then with that team, you have to, you know, while everybody else's staff has been scouting and doing all this work, I mean, Brian Gutekunst's staff has been doing this all year. They're, they've been out on the field and doing all this stuff. Um, Ryan Poles and uh, Mr. Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, um, they're going to have to do things on the fly and then come the draft and free agency. I mean, th- there's a lot of work that has to be done that's very compressed and they don't have the experience and everything else. So the first year might be a little shaky. But we'll see how it goes. I don't know. I don't know what else to say other than than that. I wish I could sit here and just start throwing shade at how stupid the pick was, but I, I have no idea. I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, in further news, a lot of people have been reaching out asking about David Bakhtiari, asking me the, the very simple question, are you concerned that maybe his career is over? Are you concerned that this is more extensive than it sounds, that this is going to be a recurring issue, et cetera, et cetera? Should we maybe just give him an inter- injury settlement and, and tell him to hit the hit the road? I You know... Fortunately, uh, Mr. Aaron Egler did a sit-down interview with David Bakhtiari, and it gave us a little bit of insight. Uh, I want to go through it. It doesn't necessarily answer any of those questions. I mean, it, it, it does, but it doesn't. Um, but it's uh, as close to, I mean, as, as answers as you can get, I guess. In summary, if I were to summarize this, because there's a lot of questions and a lot of answers, but it all kind of just comes back to it, it's all kind of just the same thing. Um, basically, he didn't just tear his ACL. He said there was additional damage. There was meniscus damage and uh, some other things. And so they went and did surgery. And um, he said he was continuing to have issues. And they went back in, went to another doctor, looked at things, took some scans, and found a bunch of issues, which is not great when uh, you get surgery. And then they're like, oh, yeah, there's a scar here, which is causing problems. And there's this here, which is causing problems. And this is so they started shaving this off and cutting this back and doing this. And he said he pretty much immediately felt better in terms of like a lot of the pain and discomfort and all that stuff was gone. The problem is his knee consistently filled with fluid. Now, according to him, this is normal for, you know, bigger guys and offensive tackles and all that. Brian Balaga and all these guys, they all carry fluid in their knees. But um, he said, generally, it's in the 20 to 30 range. I don't know what that means. Uh, CCs, I guess. Yeah, it says CCs right there. He says, Brian Balaga was in the 20 to 30 range. Um, that was kind of a normal thing for him. He had had some issues. He was trying to practice, but there was a lot of discomfort. It was so much swelling to the point where he couldn't even bend his knee. He kept draining it, and then he drained it one week, and there were 96 cc's of fluid in his knee. This was actually prior to the 96 thing, but still, the, the, the recurring issue with fluid in the knee was still an issue. And ultimately, what it sounds like is it just was not really healing. It was, it's not even that it wasn't healing. It's just that the fluid would not stop. He was saying that he, he didn't necessarily feel bad. It's just that it keeps swelling, and it keeps limiting him, and he's not able to do stuff. And it's like, he, if we could just get the fluid to stop going in my knee, I'd be fine, but it just will not stop. And I'm, I'm not a doctor, and this doesn't really come up in this um, article here, but my understanding of fluid getting in the knee is it's your body's way of protecting your knee because there's issues there. Um, which doesn't sound great to me, right? Your, 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 your body is telling you that your knee is damaged and you're hurting your knee and we need to pump a bunch of fluid in it to protect it. Um, anyways, kind of fast forwarding a little bit here. Uh, the question from Aaron is, do you arrive at the point where you decide you just have to live with it and get back on the field? He says, well, about three weeks later, I don't want to get too specific, but I had another intervention because I didn't like how my knee was responding and I'd done other things Uh, in the past that make it respond better. So I went and did that. That's when I had a huge uptick in my knee. I feel good. I don't feel like myself, but I feel good. So the week of Detroit, I'm feeling good. I'd gotten back to the 33 cc's of fluid. That 20 to 30 is your money zone. I'm probably sitting at 50 to 60 cc's. 
I got a lot of things uh, going on with my body to help with the inflammation. Aaron says, I presume the coaching staff wants to see you in game prior to the playoffs. He says, I mean, I'm hearing mumblings around the building of people wanting to see me in the game. I can tell coaches want to get me out there. I'm like, you guys really want to see me in the game. I get it. If you feel uncomfortable with me in the playoff game, sure, I get it. I'm just trying to make sure my knee feels good as possible. In other words, I'm not so sure about it, but if you want me in, let's do it. Four or five days after the Detroit game, we end up pulling 88 cc's out. I'm like, this is an effing nightmare. This thing won't end. Next question, you have to be at your wit's end at this point, having worked so hard all year. The playoffs are here, and you're basically nowhere near to moving past this fluid issue. His first sentence says, I just need to turn the car off and let it sit. So this is this is my summary, and maybe I'm wrong, but this is this is kind of where I'm at, and it's a little bit frustrating. And I get that there's some physical therapy that's necessary, but it seems relatively obvious to me. Since one week one, David Bakhtiari has been doing all these drills, right? And he even said that it's the reason that I was doing all these drills week one, although I had no real possibility of coming back is because there was after surgery and everything else, there's no like structural damage. I mean, it's basically healed, right? It's the knee is fine, but there's also other issues in terms of pain, in terms of mobility, in terms of all this fluid and everything else, which is preventing me from getting out there. But it's not that I need to wear a brace or anything because there's structural issues or concerns. It sounds relatively obvious to me that the need needed to rest. That's literally what he's saying here. The, the point is, I just need time to let it just sit. I need to sit on the couch, put my leg up, and let it just heal. And the fact is, he just would not do that, whether it because the coaches kept asking him to or whatever the case may be. He kept doing all this training. He kept doing all this stuff, and the fluid kept building and building and building, and so then they would drain it, which doesn't solve the problem. The body's still saying, nope, we need that fluid. It's just going to replace it. As long as it's it's, you know... It's tender and, and um, you know, according to the body, not fully healed. And you're out there doing NFL drills on a really giant body, by the way. Your body's going to respond by saying, dude, what do you do? Like, we got to, let's throw some protection in there again. Where did all the fluid go? I don't know. It keeps disappearing. Put more in there. I mean, it's, it's, it's not fixing it by draining it. It's just making it so that you're more comfortable, but it's not addressing the issue. And he just said at the very end here what the issue is. It just needs to rest, but they didn't allow it to rest all season. So if they maybe just allowed it to rest instead of letting him do all this training, and maybe that's, again, required for his physical therapy, I don't know, but that's the reason he couldn't go. And and you have further evidence of that by the fact that they decided to let him play against Detroit, and what happened? He went right back to, to, to the low point of 88 cc's. His body freaked out. It was like, what are you doing? It pumped him so much full of fluid. They're like, we, we need to just completely surround this knee. We need to make sure he can't even move his knee. His body is telling him his knee is not okay. And they keep going through all the training. They keep doing all this stuff. They keep, you know, putting him in games and all that. It's not going to heal. Now, the longer term question of, well, is it ever going to be okay? He goes on to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I'll be fine. But don't know. Do you have any concerns with the knee long term going forward? He says, no. The hurdle you want to get over is having full recovery from an ACL. I know my ACL is good. My meniscus is good. They cut out like 10 to 15% of it. I just need, uh, I just, it's just my knee needs rest. Structurally, it's good. Just need to take some time off. Well, hopefully, I, you know, I mean, that's, that's what you're being told. The point is, it just continues to be a problem. And, and again, it's frustrating because the, the operating theory, which makes sense, is it just needs time to fully heal itself so that it stops freaking out and pumping fluid into my knee. And if I can do that, then we'll be fine. I wish you'd been doing that the whole time. I wish we had just said, you know, you're not doing any training. Go put your 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 knee up. And any kind of, you know, physical therapy is going to be very low impact, you know, pool type stuff. Not out on the field doing all these freaking drills. And we're over here applauding like, yeah, he's looking great. Yeah, he's ruining his knee. He's He's damaging his knee. That all these cool videos of him doing all these exercises out on the field is what's going to prevent him from having any impact for us in the playoffs. So I'm fine with that that theory, that operating theory of he just needs to take this offseason to not be on his knee, and I hope he does it. You know, I hope he's not out there just living it up, playing beach volleyball and stuff. Um, Not doubting him. I'm just I'm just saying. I mean, that's that's what he needs to do, and and it kind of sucks too because the offseason is a decent time. Um, granted, he spends a good period of his time slamming beers and stuff, so I, <laughs> I don't have to be too worried. It's not like Rashawn Gary or anything where he's, you know, a large part of his success is the fact that he is a psychopath when it comes to training. I think Bakhtiari's got it from a pretty mental standpoint, as long as his body doesn't completely deteriorate, he comes back at 375 pounds or whatever. But um, again, it doesn't, 
it gives me some clarity, but it still doesn't 100% answer the question because nobody knows. I mean, David Bakhtiari, I'm sure, is, is being told, well, all you need to do is just rest, which again, why wasn't he told that in the beginning? Because it's a new operating theory, right? It's, it's, it's sort of the whole trust the science thing, which is only as good as the, the most recent science. When he was told that his knee is fine, we were told that that was the truth until we found out it wasn't the truth. And actually, the surgery kind of sucked and there's scar tissue and everything else. But then we cleaned it up, and now we're being told, well, the, the new reality is that this is that he's fine now, until we found out that that wasn't true. And then we have a new reality, until we find out that that's not true. But now the new reality is if he just rests, he'll be fine. Well, that's true until it's not true. Point is, we don't know. We have no idea. Science and reality evolve, and that's how you know you can trust it. So am I nervous? Yes, um, I am a little bit nervous. It's been a very long time, especially when you, you factor in, and again, he hasn't been giving it rest, but... It's part of the reason I don't trust this process is why didn't anyone tell him he needs to rest? Well, because apparently they were wrong about what they thought the problem was this whole time. And now that the the, the season over, is over, they have a new theory. And, and okay, well, I guess we'll trust that. But but especially when you factor in, you know, basically the, the vast majority of this recovery is done, right? He hasn't had any structural damage since the beginning of the season. He's been basically ready to go. His knee is just not responding well. That's what, what causes me the most. I mean, he's trying to make it sound like that's a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing. I haven't had any structural damage or anything for uh, basically months now. It's been completely healed. My knee is just, for some reason, not responding the way it should. It's just, it's, it's, there's something wrong. But that's, but it's fine. I'm sure if I just put my foot up, it'll be better. Well, I, I hope so. And again, the body will continue to heal itself. But the point is, we don't know. That's, that's the bottom line. He says we know and it'll be fine. Um, I'll trust that, you know, again, whatever, whatever's wrong with the body that's telling you, hey, we're, we're not healed yet. And then when he goes out and does training, they start pumping fluid into it. The body knows what the problem is and it'll start working on putting that all back together. But um, we don't know exactly what the body's capacity is to heal itself in this specific instance. So we will have to wait and see. And hopefully everything will be okay. And we probably won't know because until, you know, week two or three, the, the biggest question mark is going to be, because I'm assuming he will not play any preseason games, even if any prominent Packers do, which it sounds like that's never going to happen again. Um, But, you know, assuming he's going to play right away week one, if there's any issue, if he shows up on the injury report with a knee issue, I'm going to panic. I'm just going to panic because it's, it's, what would the reason for that be? My concern is probably some swelling. And that's, that's, that's doom in my mind. Because he's had an entire offseason to heal this thing. He put some weight on it, some some serious work into it, and he's he's uh, getting some inflammation. Or even if that happens in practice it, during the, the OTAs or whatever. So that'll be the ultimate test, but we won't know about that until next year. So um, I'm appreciative to Aaron Nagler for doing this and giving us a little bit of insight. But again, the biggest question is not really answered because nobody actually knows. David says, no, it'll be fine, but he doesn't know. Right. That's why he. I mean, he was told a lot of things that ended up not being true. This also may be one of them, but we'll have to see. Well, this is, I guess, a good a spot as any to uh, take a break before we kind of launch into a couple different Aaron Rodgers things that I've been pondering and thinking about. Some news and notes and uh, some more dramas. Um, some reports that are probably fake coming out about Rodgers that we got to talk about because that's what we do. We gotta we gotta at least entertain the possibility of it, and then also talk about how it's. Probably not real. First of all, some more uh, thank yous for new patrons. Um, Leaving off where I think I left off, uh, thank you very much to Jason for upping your pledge. Um, Thank you to John for upping your pledge. Thank you to Nevin for jumping in on the Patreons. And thank you to Mr. Ray for uh, doubling your pledge. You guys are fantastic. Really appreciate that. Andrew, I'm a failure. I forgot to reach out to you. I will do that very soon and we'll get that all squared away. But uh, thank you guys very much for everything that you do, for all your support. If you want to do that, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. You can support me for as little as a dollar a month. But more importantly, um, be sure to head over to my Twitters because at the very top, you'll find a GoFundMe to help Drew get his seizure service dog. Thank you very, very much to um, uh, Stefan for the $20 donation, as well as Chris for throwing in another 20 bucks. You guys are helping us to get there little by little, and I'm very confident that um, Andrew, uh, Andrew, that Drew is going to be able to get there very, very soon. He's also got some developments as far as some pretty big news that's going to be happening that hopefully can kind of push us at least a little bit closer to the edge, if not um, 
all the way over the top. But um, we'll, we'll see how that all materializes. Drew's also been helping me with a lot of the salary cap type stuff. So now it's not just a matter of donations. You're also uh, compensating him for helping the quality of this podcast. So um, when I went into Patreon and asked everybody for questions regarding the salary cap, I passed those along to Drew. He's going in doing some research and some homework um, on those things to get us some answers. And I'll get I'll return back to you on that. But if you have any, get it in because we're going to have a uh, another day of going through the cap as well as the draft. I've got Goose helping me with the draft content. So any draft questions you got, uh, pass it along and, and uh, Goose and I will explore those things. Finally, don't forget about a modern a modernfrontier.com if you want to uh, get yourself some meat. He's even upgraded. Oh, nice. Now he's got pictures up. That's pretty fantastic. I'm, so again, this is a brand new thing for him, uh, getting these, uh, getting this all put back together, his website and everything else. It kind of sprung on him. So he's trying to get it all set up. But he, like I said, he's got the one quarter pastured pork box, the butcher's dozen ground beef, as well as the one eighth grass fed beef box. Um, I believe there's also chicken involved, but I'm not positive. I don't see that here. But uh, again, now there's pictures involved. So you can kind of see I got that one eighth, one eighth beef box. You can see what that looks like. And just looking at the pictures, I'm getting excited, even though I have it sitting in my freezer right now. Um, so far, I've just had uh, burgers and ground beef, which I used for tacos. The burgers, not so much the ground beef I did. That was, both of those were fantastic. Um, I had the uh, top round steak because I wanted to pick like the lesser of the steaks to kind of work my way up. So I had that. That was fantastic. Uh, the kids all devoured that. And uh, just yesterday, I took out the chuck roast. So I'm going to work on uh, trying to figure out what exactly to do with the chuck roast. Probably going to end up shredding it and making beef tacos. But we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. But um, pictures are all up if you want to take a look at that. And uh, be sure to reach out and get yourself some meat, man. But let's take a break and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details All right, so let's start off um, in this sort of trio of uh, Rogers drama here. Uh, Pro Football Network has uh, put out an article via Tony Pauline. I like Tony Pauline, but it well. All right, let's just let's just look at the report here. If Aaron Rodgers leaves Green Bay, will Devontae Adams and Marquez Valdez Scantling follow? Um, the tweet, by the way, says as follows. Sources tell Tony Pauline that Aaron Rodgers has told people in confidence that wherever he ends up, he wants receiver Devontae Adams and MVS by his side. This doesn't mean a lot. I mean, we, we, we want to make a lot of this. First of all, the question is, is this even real? We've heard sources close to Aaron Rodgers before, and it's been mocked and ridiculed because 
who says? I mean, we know that Rodgers didn't talk to Pauline. We know Devontae and MVS didn't talk to Pauline. So who is providing this information that we can trust? I think at this point we should know that um, these are not really trustworthy things. Even if we're assuming that somebody is talking, we're to the point now where we also need to acknowledge that somebody is out there just trolling the media, just saying random stuff. Beyond that, though, what exactly does this even mean? Let's delve into the article and then kind of think it through. But, I mean, it, it, it doesn't really give you a lot of... In other words, what would somebody have to be told to be able to write that article or that headline? Anyways, the, the article says a couple different things. Here's the first one. The Packers' locker room was filled with anger as well as disappointment after the 49ers game. Anger, as players felt, there was enough talent on the depth chart to take the team to the Super Bowl, and the necessary adjustments were not made against the 49ers. So in other words, according to Tony Pauline, the players are mad at Matt LaFleur for not making adjustments. Um, I don't know exactly how much support they're going to get for that. The, the defense was dominant the entire game. Um, the adjustments would have to be on the offensive side of the ball, but I don't know exactly what adjustments to make. And again, Pretty much everybody is mad at Aaron Rodgers, and rightly so, because we saw the plays, we saw the designs, and we saw numerous people have shown numerous plays in which the play design was perfect, Rodgers just didn't execute. And that doesn't even include the DeGuara drop and the uh, Mercedes Lewis fumble that changed the entire course of the game, and all the, the just little things like that that also caused problems. I mean, there's also, you know, Aaron Jones, could he have kept running and, and possibly got a touchdown? Did he have to stop? Um Aaron Rodgers not putting the ball where it needs to be. So instead of catching and running, guys like Devontae are diving and, and tumbling to catch the pass. I mean, there's little things like that. So I don't know if I necessarily buy it. First of all, Tony Pauline did not do one-on-one -on -one interviews with all the players and get their insights. And every single one of them said, I'm, I'm furious with Matt LaFleur for sucking at making adjustments. This is third-hand information from somebody that talked to somebody. It might be, you know, Aaron Rodgers was frustrated about it. I don't, I have no idea if there's even anything here. But again, I don't want to get too whipped up because who says? Goes on to say, it's tough to get a feel as to what Rodgers wants to do at this point. I can tell you wherever he ends up, Rodgers has told people in confidence he wants receivers Devontae Adams and Marquez Valdez-Scantling by his side. When asked about his futures, future, Rodgers left the door open on all scenarios, and then he goes into some quotes on the Pat McAfee show. But let's just pause for one second here. Again, number one, we don't know if any of this is true. I can tell you wherever he ends up, Rodgers has told people in confidence he wants receiver Devontae Adams and MVS. Again, every time we hear about something that Rodgers said in confidence, at the very least, Rodgers has denied it. And in and, and several instances, it's been absolutely ridiculous, and it doesn't even make sense that he would ever tell anybody that. This is kind of one of those things. Now, it could possibly be that he wants, you know, he, he said... Let's think about this for a second as an option. If we're going to, you know, some people are mad at me for even entertaining this because I know that's how that works, but let's do it anyways. Because let's just, let's just leave out all the possible explanations for why this ended up in an article via Tony Pauline. When he did his exit press conference after the game or whatever, he, he talked about how he doesn't want to come back for a rebuild and he kind of wants to see what's going to happen with certain contracts and certain guys on the team. I mean, when he said that, I basically, my thought immediately was he's talking about Devontae Adams. It's entirely possible that what he's hoping and, and what this is telling us, if this is even true information, is that his hope and expectation at the very least is that those two guys get brought back. Again, I find that a little bit hard to believe considering he understands that some people have to be gutty, gutted. He also understands the horrific financial situation we're in and the fact that basically every wide receiver is up for contract for him to say, I will not come back. In other words, I don't care what you do with Zadarius. I don't care what you do with Preston. I don't care what you do with Amos. I don't care what you do with any of these guys, but I want MVS back. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about all that. I mean, especially when you're also talking about offensive linemen, right? I don't care about Billy Turner. I don't care about Lucas Patrick. I just want MVS. Now, I, again, I, I don't doubt that he's he's basically saying I'm not coming back without Devontae. But when, when you throw MVS in there, it's almost like one of those things that's sort of a red flag that's like, you know what? I think that's fake. I think that's fake. Now, I, again, if you ask Rodgers, what's he going to say? Oh, yeah, I definitely would hope to be with Devontae and MVS. They've contributed, da, 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 da. But to go so far as to say that I'm not coming back without MVS, and then to even take this to its further logical conclusion, or at least what they're trying to imply, that if and when he leaves, he intends to bring two wide receivers with him. It, it doesn't make any sense. So what are you going to do? The Packers are going to be like, hey, Rodgers, it's not going to work out. 
But uh, then they're going to go to Devontae, and Devontae's like, nope, I'm going with Rodgers. We're a package deal. And then they're like, oh, that sucks. MVS, hey, we got to work something out, man. Devontae's leaving. We need you. You're going to be our number one. This is going to be a great... Nope, sorry. I'm going with Rodgers. This is, this is like a weird thing that's not going to happen. Like, Rodgers is like, I'm leaving, and I want you guys with me. And again, it's, it's one of those things, like, do we actually think Rodgers had this conversation with these guys? Or, or is planning on having these conversations with these guys? He's supposedly out contemplating what he wants to do in, in relative solitude. I'm sure he, he hasn't even made up his mind yet as far as what he wants to do. But the one thing he knows is wherever he goes, those two guys are coming with me. And he told one of his buddies that. And then his buddy ran off and told Tony Pauline, guess what? When he leaves, he's taking these guys with him. You know, when, when you just talk through these things, they don't make a lot of sense. And so it's either, and again, I'm not saying what Tony Pauline is saying is fake, but there's, there's a lot of information out there about Aaron Rodgers that has been completely fake. And somebody's spreading it. Somebody's having a blast that apparently everybody acknowledges as a source and everything else, and they're just having a blast saying silly stuff. But yet the media keeps reporting it, and we all just keep laughing, and then the new one comes out, and, and again, it just, what are we talking about here? So I, I don't buy any of this. It, to... to when you get to the point where it, it gets to be a theory that could possibly make sense, it's also a theory that doesn't really tell us a lot. Again, like he would hope that MVS and Devontae are there when he gets back. Those are the two guys that he's really hoping would be back. If, that, if that's really all we're talking about, that also doesn't mean anything. Anyways, it does go on to quote some of the stuff he said in the Pat McAfee show, so it's worth mentioning it. Um, Quote, everything is on the table. It goes on to say, there are things that seem more plausible or more likely, which I won't necessarily get into. The most important thing is, first, the commitment to playing and to go into the offseason and training and all that stuff. And then after that, it's conversations with my agent and Brian, and then looking at the desires of the team and kind of a mindset moving forward and then making decisions from there. So if I'm reading the tea leaves here, because he's, he's trying to not say things, but sometimes you kind of give hints as to what you're talking about, incidentally. Um... He says there's a, a few things that seem more plaus- plausible or more likely, which I won't necessarily get into. He then later goes on to say, and then from there, we got to see what the team's desires are. So again, maybe I'm making this up, but it sounds like he was talking about himself when he's talking about certain things that are more likely, because he transitions from that into talking to the staff and then finding out what the team wants to do. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to say there's certain things that are more plausible, like it's it's more likely to me, that the Packers want to move on. But anyways, once we get that figured out, then I got to go find out what the team wants to do. That doesn't make any sense because you just addressed that. But maybe that's not what that means. Um, and there is a, there, there is probably a part of him that feels like he does know what the Packers want to do. And therefore, based on that, he knows what he thinks he needs to do. But um, again, the, the, the only important part of that entire thing is the first part where it says everything is on the table because it, it has to be. And even if it's not, he has to say that from a negotiating standpoint. And which is also why, and I said this last year, I don't necessarily 100% trust the Packers, although it would be odd for them to to say up and down for over a year, 100,000% if Rodgers comes back, we want to bring him back. And then Rodgers like, all right, I'm coming back. And they're like, mm, yeah, we're going to trade you. So we were kind of lying and bluffing this whole time. We didn't think you would, you know, come back or whatever. So anyways, I, I can't really see that scenario either. So I, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get... Uh, too whipped up into anonymous reports, especially from, uh, you know, Roger's quote unquote inner circle, hashtag inner circle, because we've seen the fruits of that. And I'm certainly not going to walk on that landmine as a quote unquote media member. Anyways, um, moving off of that, I want to transition to uh, two different things. First of all, there's a lot of talk, and this has been happening pretty much all season. And it's just another thing that consistently annoys me. And I, everybody's, a lot of people are very annoyed with Aaron Rodgers because every time on Tuesday, he goes on the Pat McAfee show and he talks about his vaccine status. And usually it comes down to him saying, people are rooting against me because I'm not vaccinated. And people lose their mind. I'm so tired of him playing the victim card. I'm so tired of that. Um, I had Jason send me another clip of Colin Coward. So apparently this is the Colin Coward uh, show now, the Colin Coward reaction show. I don't know. I didn't seek it out. I didn't find it. He sent it to me. <sighs> I'm trying to decide if I want to play the clip. I don't think I do because he really drags it out and, and I can summarize it a lot faster. He calls him a magician, right? He, he's the master of distraction. What do, what do magicians do? They do illusions. They, they show you your right hand and they're really doing a trick with their left hand over here, right? 
And so the, the big magic trick that he's doing is rather than taking blame for the loss, he comes on Pat McAfee's show and he's like, everyone's just rooting against us because I'm not vaccinated. Um, that was taken entirely out of context. I didn't watch the full Pat McAfee thing, but I did see that segment of it. He was directly asked that question. And I, I complain about this all the time with the media in general. They basically ask questions so that they can get an answer so that they can write an article about it. For example, this is a bad example, but I just, I just need something to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Aaron, what did you think of Devontae's performance in this game? Aaron's like, I think Devontae had a great game. So then they write an article, Aaron Rodgers credits Devontae Adams with having a great game or with winning the game or whatever. The point is the article is basically written. I just need some, some clips from you. I just need a couple quotes so that I can put that in my article. That's basically already half written. They know what they're going to say, but then they pretend as though, or they, they make it seem as though it was unsolicited content, right? They make it sound as though Aaron Rodgers just went to the podium and was like, dude, Devontae, let, before we get started, let me just talk about Devontae for a minute. Or, or maybe even a better example would be if, if they asked about an upcoming opponent. What are your thoughts on, um, on Justin Fields coming up next week? And Matt LaFleur says, you know, uh, Justin Fields is a great player and uh, he's showing some progress. And he's de- he does this coach speak thing because Matt LaFleur will never put anybody down. He always praises no matter who you ask. But then you write an article saying Matt LaFleur says Justin Fields is a great football player. It's taken out of context because the proper context is I asked him what he thought and he said he's good. If you just hear that, you kind of intuitively understand he's, what is, what is he supposed to say? I think he's freaking sucks. He's garbage. We're going to just destroy this kid. He doesn't stand a chance. He's going to throw four picks. We're going to sack him a bunch because the offensive line is trash. The Bears are trash. Screw that team. I mean, he could, but he won't. He'll never do that. He always just does what most coaches do. They're a great football player. Bill Belichick, doesn't matter who it is. The coaches are going to, you ask him about another player. Oh, he's a good player. He's a, you know, I don't know. He's a, you know what me to say? He's a good player and, uh, you know, he's uh, making strides and, you know, and stuff like that. And so when you have Colin Coward out here taking a quote from Aaron Rodgers talking about how some people were rooting against me because of my vaccine status, he's making it seem as though he went on TV and said, let me say, I got to tell you something here, Pat, before we get started. Um, Just so you know, everybody was rooting against me because of my vaccine status. Everyone's attacking me all the time. That's not what happened. Pat McAfee directly asked him, do you think some people are rooting against you because of your vaccine status? He said, yes. You know why? Because it's true. What's he going to do? Is he just going to lie and say, no, nobody cares about that? That would be a lie. And you know it's a lie. And, and the funny thing is the people who are most angry at Aaron Rodgers for saying this stuff are the ones that know that he's 100% correct because they're the ones that are angry about Aaron Rodgers. They're the ones that can't let this go. And so although I understand some people saying that he should stop um, worrying about it and stop talking about it, here's my issue. Aaron Rodgers is reacting to the reality that some people can't let this go. One of the things that I hate on social media, and I've, I've mentioned this a couple times, one of my least favorite social media tactics is somebody will come along and say, just, just another bad example. I go on Twitter and I say, um, Devontae Adams is a great wide receiver. Somebody comes along and they say, Devontae sucks. He's only good because of Rodgers. I respond to that in whatever. Stats doesn't matter. And then they respond to that saying, wow, sensitive? Touched a nerve, huh? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Suddenly, I'm the sensitive one. Suddenly, I'm the one that's attacking. Suddenly, I'm I'm the one. They're on their heels like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? Like, calm down here. What's your problem? Like, dude, why are you pretending? So it's, it's almost funny. It's it's You've got people that are constantly pouncing on Aaron Rodgers. And if you don't believe me, look at what happened when we lost. We have Packers writers writing about his vaccine status after the loss, gloating, almost gleeful at his loss. Go look on social media and tell me I'm lying. Do I, you want me to pull up the articles right now? You know I'm not lying. There are people who cannot let this go. We just got over the fact of Hub Arkush basically saying, I'm not voting for him for MVP because of his vaccine status. It's not that Rodgers can't let it go. It's that everybody else can't let it go. They can't stand the guy. We got reports about a GM that doesn't want him because of his vaccine status. We've got reporters that will not let it go. We've got fans that are especially angry at Aaron Rodgers because of his back. I promise you, I'm 100,000% positive that they're using this as an excuse to finally just say, I'm done with this guy. Because the fact of the matter is they've always been angry at him since his vaccine status. And they've come out and said, you know, I mean, they've, they've basically said it, but now that he's failed... Now they have the right to disconnect him from the Green Bay Packers. Now they have a reason to say, I don't want him on this team and pretend it's not about his vaccine status. Now it's about, well, it's because he can't win. And now I just get to entirely hate the guy. 
now I can just completely hate the guy. Whereas before he was still the Packers quarterback and I still had to root for him. But if he's just gone, I can put my full force of hate into this guy. That's what Rod, that is the reality. And you could, well, he's playing the victim card. Well, I mean, he's, he's, he's just saying reality. You can, you can throw out cliches if you want, but let's address reality as it stands. There's no question, that's not even debatable, that some people wanted to see Aaron Rodgers fail because of his status. Not just the fact that he's not vaccinated, but the fact that he's been vocal about it, the fact that he mentioned Joe Rogan. All these things that you've heard a thousand times because it's actually out there, it's real. So again, he didn't solicit this. He basically answered a question and he answered it truthfully. What do you want him to say to that question? What are his options when, when Pat McAfee says, do you, do you think some people were um, rooting against you because of your vaccine status? What's he supposed to say? No. You, 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 you expect him to lie to cover for you and your, your rabid anger. How dare you acknowledge that I am a rabid psychopath who cannot stop hating a guy for a decision he made that impacts nothing in my life? I'm sorry. He's not the crazy one. He's not. And you can keep saying, well, he just keeps playing the victim card. Stop going after him and he'll stop talking about it. But it's still going on. How about this article? From uh, immediately after, again, you want to talk about like the gloating? Aaron Rodgers silenced from Super Bowl platform thanks to the 49ers. Mocking him for saying he's being silenced, right? Just mo- just gloating. Nancy Armour. This is on PackersNews.com on USA Today. Here's the full article. Aaron Rodgers silenced from Super Bowl platform, and we can thank Robbie Gold for that. In other words, thankfully, he lost, so we don't have to hear him talk. Oh yeah, but he's just, he's just playing the victim. This frickin' article was written long before we lost. The San Francisco 49ers aren't the only ones who ought to be giving thanks for Robbie Gold. By eliminating Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers from the playoffs Saturday night, the 49ers kicker spared Commissioner Roger Goodell and the NFL a colossal headache. No longer do they have to fear Rodgers overshadowing the Super Bowl with his dangerous misinformation about COVID-19 and vaccines proven to minimize the the virus's worst effects. Oh yeah, but he's just making this up. The gloating, the excitement on PackersNews.com. Thank you. Thank you for eliminating the Packers so we don't have to hear Aaron Rodgers give his opinion, his dangerous opinions that are going to kill people. He's a horrible, dangerous person. Also, he's making this stuff up. He's just playing the victim. Nobody actually cares. Nobody cares. Only Rodgers cares. He's making this up. But also, thank, thank the good Lord in heaven, he was eliminated by Robbie Gold. He spared us all death and disease and misery from, from his dangerous opinions. You guys are pathetic. It's hilarious because almost the very next, it is literally the very next sentence. They don't have to grit their teeth and watch as Rodgers whines to the world, literally given the global attention the Super Bowl commands, about he and other unconventional intellects are being quote-unquote silenced. You're putting that in the article. In the exact article, you're saying thank you for shutting this guy up and then also saying, he thinks he's being silenced. Nobody wants to silence him. As I write an article saying thank you for shutting him up so that we don't, so nobody has to hear his dangerous opinions, but he's not being, you guys are insane. By the way, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. His platform is not any less. His, his biggest platform is Pat McAfee show and he's still doing the Pat McAfee show. What do you think? He's going to take out a Super Bowl ad that telling people not to get the vaccine, which by the way, he's never once said, don't get the vaccine. People, that's another thing. People like to take what he said and twist it to make it sound worse than it is. Because again, it's not about his dangerous information. It's about the fact that he made a decision that you don't like. He has an opinion that you don't agree with, and you're not allowed to have different opinions according to the thought police. And yes, that's what you are. And whether you want to get mad about that or not, Go ahead and get mad. But you're mad that he has an opinion that you don't agree with and you don't think he should be allowed to and he certainly shouldn't be allowed to talk about that opinion because it's not an approved opinion. That's what Aaron Rodgers has been saying and he's been right the whole time. You're the problem. You're the angry one. You're the attacking one. You're the silencing one. You're the one who's doing all the things that Rodgers is saying and he's just reporting it. He's just saying this is what they're doing and then you get mad. Oh, he's whining. He's playing the victim. He did. He's just explaining reality as it is. If you don't like that reality, stop being crazy. Problem solved. But you want to be able to attack him, and then he has to keep his mouth shut about it. You want it to go away, leave the guy alone. But you can't do that, can you? By the way, he didn't come out with this information. You forced it out of him. He never solicited... He He tried to lie to you. He tried to lie to avoid all this because he doesn't want this to be a public opinion. He doesn't want this to be a big deal. He doesn't want to tell people what to do. He said, yep, I'm immunized. You know why? Because he wanted to just let this go all completely unnoticed. You're the ones that have been dragging this out and forcing it out into the light so that you can beat him publicly. In communist China, they call it struggle sessions. 
where you put somebody up to the front and you shame them. You tell them, you have to tell us your crimes. And then as they say it, you scream at them and people will get up and punch them right in the face and throw things at them and spit on them. Oh, I can't believe you're comparing it to that. I'm just saying, this is the same mentality. And if you think there are nobody that would actually love to be able to do that to Rogers, you're also out of your mind. Also hilarious, she puts in your note, before anyone starts squawking about quote-unquote freedom. <laughs> it's so funny when these people just, they get so annoyed at things like freedom. Before you start with your freedom nonsense. Okay. Again, you want the proof? Here it is. And I, I can go on and on. So I'm sorry. I'm just not buying it. I'm, 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 I'm more annoyed with hearing people complain about him giving his opinion than him giving his opinion. Go on social media right now. If anybody gives an opinion and somebody says you shouldn't have that opinion, what happens? How dare you? How dare you? But if Rogers does it, he shouldn't be allowed to because that's not an approved opinion. Give me a break. Here's another article. Same with PackersNews.com. This time from Kendra Minert. Late night hosts get another round of Aaron Rodgers jokes after Packers playoff loss against the 49ers. By the way, how would you handle this stuff? You can't even handle it if anybody disagrees with you on Twitter. You go into a meltdown mode, you find all your Twitter friends to go attack them and get them blocked and banned and shamed and everything else. This guy is dealing with people writing articles that thousands of people will see. And everybody, again, literally late night hosts with, with millions of views are, are mocking you. And what? He's, well, he should just suck it up. Okay, princess. Yeah, I'm sure he should just suck it up. And what are you going to do? Late night talk show host picked up where Twitter left off when it came to throwing punches at Aaron Rodgers after the Green Bay Packers season ending loss to the San Francisco 49ers in the NFC Division game Saturday at Lambeau Field. On Monday night, the quarterback found himself once again the target of jokes after a year in which he misled the public on his vaccine status, touted unproven treatments for COVID-19, and in an ESPN interview published a day before the 49ers game, criticized President Joe Biden and his Quote, in uh, his fake White House set saying that this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Oh, I forgot about that, too. He also made fun of Joe Biden. So people are really, really, really mad at him and so happy that he lost. I literally just am telling you two articles back to back on one website in which that is the case. You're going to call me a liar? So again, if you don't want Rogers to say things like people are rooting against me because of my vaccine status, you have to demonstrate that that's not true. And you can't because I just showed you that it is. And so then she goes on to talk about how people like Jimmy Fallon mocked him, which apparently isn't happening. He's just playing the victim. He's saying that these things are true and it's not. We're pretending as though everybody's just like, yeah, dude, it's fine, whatever you want to do. And he's like, oh, you hate me because of my status. And like, no, dude, you're, you're free to do whatever you want. I don't care. But that's not the reality. That's not what you're doing. You're not saying, I don't really care, dude. Just go live your life. Nobody cares what you do. You're not saying that. You're not doing that. That's not the reality. It was a weekend of upsets on Saturday. Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers hosted the San Francisco 49ers and lost in Green Bay. In other words, Aaron Rodgers failed his at-home test, Fallon said in his opening monologue. Nobody cares about his vaccine status. Nobody cares. Nobody's mocking him. Nobody's attacking him. Nobody's rooting against him. Everybody loves him. It's just a, he's just making this up. He's playing the victim. No, he is the victim. Whether you think he should suck it up or not, that's, that's fine, I guess. Go tell everybody on Twitter to suck it up. When one of your friends gets attacked on Twitter for having an opinion, why don't you go tell them to suck it up? Stop playing the victim. You're not going to do that. Because one person is your friend and one person you dislike because of their decisions. That's called hypocrisy. Ahead of his loss to the 49ers, Rogers criticized the CDC, President Biden, and the fake White House in an interview with ESPN. Uh, what a year for Rogers. He could be the first person named MVP and governor of Florida. But, um, tss, He's making it up. Nobody's nobody's mocking him. Nobody's going after him. Nobody's he's not there, there's not national television shows where he's being made fun of him. The entire crowd is laughing and there's articles written by Packers writers mocking him and there's not Packers podcasters and Packers personalities on Twitter who are saying good get him out of here. I can't stand this freaking guy pretending that it's not his vaccine status when in reality you know it is and you know that it's the fact that he attacked the president and that makes you upset. So again, rather than being a coward and, and, and pretending that this isn't real and that he's just playing the victim, just engage with it. Engage with the information or just be honest and say, you're right. I hate him because of his stance. I hate him because he doesn't like the president. I hate him because he's not vaccinated. I hate him because he's friends with Joe Rogan. I hate him for all these reasons. And for that reason, I want him gone. Stop hiding behind, oh, he's just playing the victim. He's not playing anything. He's just stating reality as it is. He doesn't want, again, he doesn't want any of this. He doesn't want this to be front and center. He tried to hide it. And that's supposedly what you guys are the maddest about, but I doubt it. Because again, you guys drug it out. You're forcing it out into the open. And again, you're trying to turn this into a struggle session, but the point is he shouldn't be fighting back. That's the problem. How dare you fight back? You stand there and take the shaming session with your head hung. Don't fight back. You're not allowed to fight back. How dare you? And so listen, it's not going to stop. 
It's, there's not going to be a situation in which you shame him so much he puts his head down. The more you keep pushing, the more he's going to push back. That's it. I'm sorry you don't like that. I'm sorry you wish that there was a world in which you could mock and ridicule and attack the guy, and he just comes out and says, no, everything's fine. I deserve it. I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. I'm so sorry. I, I know that's what you want. That's never going to happen. So you can either leave him alone and let him make his decisions as an adult and let everybody make their own decisions with their life, And move on with your own life like an adult and stop whining and complaining about other people's decisions and stop letting that keep you up at night. Be a grown-up and just leave the guy alone or keep going after him and he's going to keep coming right back after you. Those are your options. But stop pretending that he's just playing the victim. He's not. He's just stating reality. And you're living in a fantasy world pretending that these things aren't happening, that he's not being mocked and ridiculed and attacked. Oh, he's a victim. He's a multimillionaire. So what? He's not being silenced. He has a national platform. Right, and that pisses you off, doesn't it? It makes you angry that he has a platform. That's the point. You don't want to have him to have a platform. You want him to lose his sponsors. You want him to be taken off of Pat McAfee's show. In fact, guys like Pat McAfee make you mad because they allow a platform in which he's allowed to speak. It's part of the reason why the, the, the media as, a, as an entity doesn't like people like Joe Rogan and Pat McAfee because they allow people to be to go out and speak that you don't think should be allowed to speak. That's the point he's trying to make. It's not that he found a way around your silencing. It's the fact that you want him to shut up. You want him to not be able to speak. That's the point. And you can pretend that that's not a real point. You can pretend that that's not a thing. You can pretend all you want, but that's the reality and you got to live with it. If that's what you want and that's who you are, embrace it. Yes, I believe in silencing people. Yes, I believe in in thought policing. Yes, I believe in all these things. That's who I am. That's what I believe. Stand by that. But don't be that person and pretend you're not that person. You want to be an angry, vindictive person, fine, but don't don't pretend that Rogers is, you know, I mean, you're you're basically gaslighting. Oh, you're crazy. These things aren't happening. They're literally happening. It's it's not even, it's it's in plain sight. (laughs) And so all around, you're just seeing people raging and angry and, oh, Rogers, I can't stand the guy. There's no, there's no, those things aren't happening. Nobody's making fun of him. Jimmy Jimmy Fallon makes fun of him, but that didn't happen. And all over Packers, PackersNews.com. Articles mocking him and being gleeful and giddy about he lost. Thank you, Robbie Gold. Thank you. Thank you for shutting up Aaron Rodgers, but there is no silencing. Don't say he's being silenced, but thank you for shutting him up. Literally one sentence apart. You guys are psycho. (laughs) You guys are insane. Late night with Seth Meyers, immediately after Rodgers loses. And by the way, a lot of people, Tom Brady lost. Did he get mocked? No. Why? Because what we really care about is the guy made fun of Joe Biden and he's unvaccinated. So we're going to mock him. We didn't mock Tom Brady. And even if we mock Aaron Rodgers, we're not mocking about the fact that he lost. It's not the fact that he can't seem to win another Super Bowl. It's not any of these other little things. It's his vaccine status. NFL reportedly notified unvaccinated players last week that they will no longer be required to be tested daily for the coronavirus. In fact, some of them don't even have to come to work. Myers says, as a photo of Rodgers popped up during the, the host take on the latest news headline, Ah, got him. How about Jimmy Kimmel? Aaron Rodgers, you may recall, was caught in a series of lies about his vaccine status earlier in the season. Oh, his series of lies. Before the game, he lashed out at President Biden. He said, we have a fake White House, a bunch of other stuff befitting a man who has been hit in the head a lot of times. But Karen Rodgers wasn't the only anti-vaxxer speaking out this weekend. That's his monologue. Gee, that's a funny skit, isn't it? I'm still laughing. That's just pure anger. And it's pure hatred toward a guy because he made a decision that you don't like. I'm just baffled by Of all the things to be angry with, of all the stuff going on in the world, Rogers hasn't done anything to hurt anybody. Again, especially with Omicron going on, nothing doesn't make a difference. You are going to get it. You are going to spread it. That's the reality. But we, it's still, but still, he still made that decision I don't like. He's also more at risk now. His risk is almost still zero, but he's still at risk, more so, and that makes me angry for, for some reason. Nothing makes sense anymore. None of this makes any sense. And you guys got to stop it. You got to just stop being angry for the sake of being angry. It's, it's not helping anything. But at the very least, if you're not going to stop, and if you're going to keep doing what Kendra's doing by just gleefully being giddy about the Packers' loss, or like Nancy's doing, just, just giddy about it. <laughs> they lost. <laughs> Stupid Rogers is silenced now. Yay. Now he can't say he's silenced anymore because he's so silenced he can't even say it. <laughs> if you're going to do that, then Rodgers is going to go on a national platform and say, you guys are a bunch of idiots and a bunch of jerks, and I don't like you. He's going to call jerks jerks, and you're going to have to deal with that, I guess. Just like you can call him a liar for being a liar. Yep, that's true. And you're going to go out and say he doesn't have the right to make that decision. He's going to go on 
television and say, I do have that right, and you have no right to tell me what to do, and then that's it. But you can't say it's fake. You can't say he's not he's not telling the truth and that all this is made up because it's not made up. And he's not just playing the victim. And Colin Coward calling him a magician as though this is just him trying to distract from what happened. He took responsibility. Again, he's taking that completely out of context. He's not taking responsibility. Rather than just addressing the fact that he was terrible, he's over here talking about his vaccine status and how people are attacking him. No, he's taking responsibility for the fact that he didn't play well. He was asked a direct question from Pat McAfee about whether or not some people are rooting against him, and he said yes, which is true. I mean, he, he even just flat out lies in this thing. Colin Coward, so, so here, I'm, I'm not going to play the clip. I, it's too much work to set that up. He says, on, on the left hand, you have Aaron Rodgers, who played scared and played terrible and all that stuff. And on the right hand, he's saying everybody was rooting against us. That's not what he said. And he goes on to read the quote as it pops up here. There's a lot of people tuning in rooting against us for one reason and one reason only, and it's be only my vaccine status. By the way, those people have come out and admitted that at this point. But again, Colin Coward is building this whole narrative and his whole show is based on, he's just, he's coming out with this. He's doing this to distract from the fact that he played poorly. No, he's not. And anybody that goes and listens to what was said would recognize that he has taken accountability for what he said. He was asked a question about it and he just acknowledged it. He said, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no question. There's a lot of people tuning in, rooting against us for one reason and it's because I, of my vaccine status and it's true. And you know it's true because I gave you a couple examples. And also, again, the people who are most angry that he's saying this are the people that are rooting against him because of his vaccine status. All these reporters, you think Hub Arkish isn't just, just so unbelievably excited, not just because the Packers lost and he's a Bears fan, but Aaron Rodgers lost, and it was largely because he played bad. This is the best thing that could possibly happen. They can't stand the guy. So again, I don't, I don't really care what your opinions are on it. I don't care what his opinions are on it. That has nothing to do with anything. But stop attacking the guy, and then when he responds saying, oh, he's so sensitive. No, you stop first, okay? You're not getting hit. You're getting hit back. You're being hit back. It's a counterpunch against you, and then you're pretending you're being attacked. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. You want it to go away, leave the guy alone, period. No more gloating, no more making fun of the guy. And, and again, well, I don't have a right to. You do have a right to. But if you're going to do it, he's going to respond. And he has a right to do that. If you want this all to go away, you are the one that has to make it go away because he's just responding. He's not coming out with this stuff. He didn't solicit anything. He didn't come out and say, here's what I think everybody should do. Again, he tried to hide it for a reason because he didn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to be seen as a doctor. He doesn't want to come out with these things. But the fact of the matter is you forced it out. You went on the attack. You started calling the guy an idiot. So he decided, you know what? I'm going to come out and I'm going to give my opinion. You guys want to go there? Let's go there. You want to go to war? Let's go to war. So fine. If you want to stand on the battlefield with Aaron Rodgers, go do it. But don't sit there and pretend like you're not the one who's on the offensive. You are. Go ahead and fight with the guy. Go ahead and battle with the guy. But stop lying. It's embarrassing. It's like those people when you get into a, a debate and they want to say, well, well, you're the one who has to prove your point. I don't have to prove anything. I'm, I'm, I'm like the neutral stance. You're the one who has to prove your, your stance. I don't have to prove my stance. No, I'm sorry. Everybody has to, to you know, defend their own positions. Don't just, I don't know, man. I, I, I just don't like that this is such an underlying thing in general. You know, there's enough going on right now. And the fact that there's this other underlying thing, it, it's, it's kind of similar to, to how race plays into football sometimes. You know, when there's undertones of it, whether it's people not liking somebody because of their race or somebody only liking somebody because of their race, and you know that's going on and you try to just ignore it and you try to just move on and be like, yeah, it's maybe just an informed opinion. Maybe they genuinely just like or don't like their play, like or don't like that hire. But you know what's going on and you, you, you just wish it wasn't a thing. You wish people weren't so stupid that they cared about stuff like that. But you know that that's, that's the majority narrative, right? You try to ignore the fact that it, it plays into things like that, but it's just, it's hard not to because you're dealing with so many stupid people and you're, you're trying to be rational in a sea full of people that have no interest in that. We're going to have this mini race war because we're just a bunch of idiots. And it's like, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I'm just trying to look at how well the guy played, I guess. And it's the same with this. You know, we're, we're, I'm going to try to pretend that all these opinions about Aaron Rodgers are objective, but you know, underlying this, you have people that support him because of his vaccine stance, and you have people that don't support him because of his vaccine stance. And that's going to be the driving factor in, in their opinion of the guy, and their opinion of whether or not he should stay, which should have no bearing on whether or not he should stay. But whether I like or dislike him because of his political stance is now the main driving factor. Just like uh, whether I like or dislike somebody because of their skin color is a major dri driving factor for many people on, on social media and in this country. And I think both of those things are pathetic 
and disgusting. And that's, that's whether you support or detract from somebody because of their skin color or their political stance. You guys got to grow up, dude. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's just insane. I'm tired of having to constantly come back to this. But it just, again, you guys just won't leave it alone. So here we are again. And so again, I'm going to unload. And then it's like, all right, hopefully we're done with this. Hopefully we can move on. Hopefully we can just get back to football. But it's not going to end. This is not going to stop. It never stops. Because people just can't let stuff go. It's unbelievable to me how people can't let stuff go. This was a long time ago. He made a decision. He's not going to change his mind. What are we going to do moving forward? What, what is it going to take for you guys to just let this go? What's it going to take? He just has to leave the NFL? That's... <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say, man. And again, it's not going to end there because there's other people who have the same position. Kirk Cousins was the same thing. People can't stand the guy once they found out that he was unvaccinated. People that didn't like him started disliking him a lot more. His own coach was treating him like garbage. Like, this is, this is so weird to me, man. I just, I don't live in that world. I mean, I obviously have opinions, but it, you, you can't separate them? How can you not separate this? And again, just the, the cowardice of hiding behind it, like pretending you're just so mad at, at his performance when really you just want to lash out at a guy for opinion you don't like, but you're going to pretend that that's not it. Because apparently you know that you shouldn't do that, but, but you want to do it anyway, so you're going to hide behind it. I just, I, again, I don't, I don't understand how people's brains work. I don't, I don't get how that stuff happens. I'm just annoyed with it. I'm tired of it. Freaking leave the guy alone. Grow up. Get over it. And that's, that's generally true of, of whatever it is. And the, the bigger point here is I think he would love nothing more than for this to go away. It's not, again, it's not like he's out there trying to push anything. This is being pushed on him and he's responding to it and that's it. So I don't, I don't want this to be, I'll be completely honest, I keep forgetting about it. I, I, I swear to you, I keep forgetting about it because I, I'm, I'm engaged with what's going on with, I was engaged with the 49ers game and, and his play and all this stuff and and then, like, the, the, the criticism of Rodgers just reached a point where it was like, what the heck is it? Like, this is taking it a little too far. And it's like, oh, that's right. He said he doesn't like Joe Biden and he's not vaccinated. I forgot. So people are going to go crazy. And then you start reading Packers articles and seeing those things pop up. And it's like, you guys are just pathetic, man. I mean, it's like, I, I don't even want to be a part of this. Like, this, this is such an embarrassment. Like, we're not, I, I'm, I'm not dealing with serious people. I thought I was dealing with serious people. I thought I was dealing with Packer fans that want to talk about Packer stuff and have serious intellectual conversations. And, and you know, I mean, if we want to have fun with some things and some conspiracy theories and, you know, maybe what if, maybe even the Devontae thing, like, what if he takes Devontae and NBA, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll have that stupid conversation if you want. But it's like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. This is what I don't want to do. And I wish people would just declare that that's what they're doing so we could just cut them out and just continue on having serious conversation. Just raise your hand and say, I can't get over it. I can't let it go. I hate him because of his decisions and I can't let it go. Great. Sounds good. You go over there. We're going to come over here and try to talk about football. Anyways, there was another thing I wanted to bring up, but we'll save that for tomorrow. And again, I hope that this is the last time I have to do this, but I'm sure it's not going to be because you know what? There's going to be another Tuesday and it's going to come up. And guess what? He's seen all the late night clips. He saw Jimmy Fallon. He saw all these guys. He probably saw a lot of the articles. He's hearing a lot of the rumors. He's hearing all the different attacks against him. And it's probably bothering him a little bit, just like it would bother you a little bit. And when Pat McAfee says, hey, I got a question. How are you feeling about this? He's going to give his honest answer because that's what he does now. And so it's not going to go away, unfortunately. Every time he pops into the news, that's going to be the, the top headline. Something to do with that. And it's just... I guess it's it's borderline depressing <laughs> because it's like I just don't want this I don't want this to be a part of 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 what this is but it just is what it is. And again, like I said, I'm I'm just a fireman putting out fires, man. I just respond to what's out there and unfortunately this is it. This is the world you've created that I'm responding to. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to care about this. I don't want to talk about this again and again and again, but here we are because you can't freaking let it go. Again, I'm responding to Colin Coward, who makes a big deal about something that he's lying about. He's distorting it to make Aaron Rodgers look bad and, and frame this in a way in which it's not real. And a lot of people didn't hear it, and they don't actually know what happened, and they're, take, and they're allowing him to take it out of context to put Aaron Rodgers in a light that is less flattering than it should be, making him look worse than they should. For, no, for what reason? For what reason? Why is he doing that? That's well, just what they do. But whatever. Is what it is, man. I'll be here. If we want to play stupid games, then I guess I'll just be responding to stupid people playing stupid games. That's just what it is. Hoping we can have something a little more serious, something a little more interesting coming up. 
it's funny. I, I I get scolded for talking about the draft because we don't even know anything about that yet, but you guys can have this conversation and it's not stupid. Come on. At least I want to talk about football. At least I want to talk about our team. I mean, do we have to do this in the draft now? But by the way, we do do this. I mean, uh, the Bosa's are still hated because apparently they were Trump supporters. But I mean, do, is that what we have to do? We have to vet who they voted for before we uh, before we draft them? He's a great prospect, but I tell you what, he holds some some views that I don't agree with. So hopefully he never gets drafted and goes to prison. <laughs> I mean, just, I don't care. Be a part of the interview process when they start uh, interviewing draft prospects. You, uh, you ever read Ayn Rand? Do you know who that is? You a uh, Milton Friedman guy by chance? Don't lie to me, boy. You wouldn't happen to be a fan of quote-unquote freedom, would you? <laughs> you one of those people? If I said negative income tax, have any thoughts on that? And of course, we're going to have to know vaccine status. And that one actually makes at least a little bit more sense because that has implications on the team, although the NFL is basically just walking all the vaccine requirements back. But at least in that case, it would kind of make sense because you don't want to negatively impact your team based on that. So it's, I could get that, but I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Again, you just tell me what you want to talk about. That's what we'll talk about. But I got to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. Try your best to not be a jerk. Leave people alone. Mind your own freaking business. And um, you'll probably be a lot happier. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.